Well, we are uh, in our part two of um, technology and um, ministry. And John Dyer, is the, I want to introduce you to him. He's Executive Director of Communications and Educational Technology here at DTS. He was uh, a youth pastor for five years in College Station before that. And he has more than 10 years experience as a web developer for Apple, Microsoft, Harley Davidson, and the Department of Defense. He is uh, the author of the book, From the Garden to the City, The Redeeming and Corrupting Power of Technology. It's a text that's uh, used by colleges and universities on the topic of technology and faith. Um, he works with young adults at Irving Bible Church. He's uh, the husband of Amber and the dad to two of the cutest kids you'll ever see, Benjamin and Rebecca. And uh, when he's done, um, if you would like to talk with John, have some questions for him, there'll be a brown bag in Todd 114. Um, you can share lunch and we can talk about technology. John? Well, thanks again for having me. It's such a privilege to stand up here with the professors that, that shaped me, and um, it's, it's really fun to get to, to be with you students this week. Well, yesterday, you know, we talked a little bit about how um, the iPhone is not actually in the Bible, unless you take that really literally, but, um, but it, does, it does address some issues with technology, and even when we look at our own Bibles and we open them up, we notice verse numbers and chapter numbers that, that weren't there with the original authors, that those are something that we added a few centuries ago. And so even those of us who don't feel like we're tech savvy at all, when we look at the Bible, we see it through kind of a, a technological grid. We think in verses, we think kind of in tweets. And so everything we do here as Christians sometimes is more technologically influenced than we often give credit for. And yet, you know, when we look at the biblical story, we, we see it starts out in a, in a garden and everything is pristine and beautiful, but, but God wants us to do something with that garden. He asks us to cultivate and make something with it. And at the end of the story, we don't go back to the garden, but we end up in a city with all the things that humans have made. So that Christ here at the center, who is labeled a, a tecton and an artisan, someone who makes and crafts things, and we, and we translate that as carpenter, but this person who made us and who made things out of wood, that he's redeeming not just our souls and not just our hearts, but also all the things that we've made. And so we look at this story and we see that, you know, technology is something that's both God-given and we also look back through church history and we see that time and time again we see technology is, is transforming, is making a big difference in what we do in ministry. So what I want to do today is look at, you know, a, a few areas that you'll probably face in the next few years. And um, the, the way I want to kind of illustrate this for you is that if we think back 10 years ago, we think there were no smartphones, there was no Facebook, there was no Twitter, there were no iPads, there were no flat screen TVs for under $10,000. It was a really different place 10 years ago. We were just getting used to the web and it was over there on a computer and now it's something that we do every day. These phones that we all carry around now that we've been taught to carry on, we probably won't have them in another 10 years, right? Something else will come along. These things are gonna constantly be changing and, and this both, uh, again, excites me and it terrifies me at the same time. So I want to address a couple things that I think will be coming up for us both, in, both today and also some ideas that you can be thinking about for the future. And the first one is, is just this idea that we need to be continually trying to understand technology in order to reach our culture. And I'll, and I'll illustrate it this way um, just, to, just to give us an example of how we all think about it. This is Alan Kay, the guy that invented the mouse. And he would say that most of us tend to view technology as things invented after we were born. So stuff before we were born like cars and airplanes and radios and televisions and air conditioning and light, none of us think of that stuff as technology, but we think of things after we were born as technology. But interestingly, that means that my son, who's four, he doesn't know a world without iPads any more than I know a world without computers. Or Dr. Pentecost knows a world without, well, I don't know. But, um, <laughs> but we, we all have a way that we view, view technology. And if we look through, you know, kind of history and we think about all these things and when they got invented, everything before us, if we were born in the 60s, looks a certain way to us. And somehow we get used to all of that stuff. And then sometime around the time we turn 30, all that stuff from zero to 30 is cool, amazing stuff we can build a career and a ministry on. But then things start to feel foreign to us after a while. So I'm, I'm getting on into my 30s and I'm, I'm kind of afraid of the iPad. Dr. Bailey keeps trying to get me to get one, but I, I don't like them. And so uh, as, you, as you move along here on the time frame, though, and you have somebody else who's born in a different era, 
they see things differently. So for them, what's cool is different than for somebody else, and that can sometimes create conflict zones. Now, and I'll tell you that as these people get older, there will be things that will come along, like jetpacks or teleporters or Google Glass, and they're gonna have to deal with those things too. But whatever we were born with feels normal to us, and at some point, it doesn't in the future. So it used to be that you could tell two cultures by the color of their skin or what they wore, and their children looked the same as them. But now what we're seeing is that sometimes we have two different cultures based on what kind of device they use. And so we have now cultures that are separated not by color of their skin or by how they dress, but by what tools they use. Remember we talked yesterday about the importance of language all the way back into the garden before the fall. Language is such a deep part of who we are. And the tools we use to communicate with language really becomes a part of who we are. So if we were in a church, and here's all the things you might hear in a given church on, on, any, on any day, and you heard these things, but suddenly you started to notice that you were hearing them in a slightly different way, Right? The language was changing in your church. This is Thai, by the way. You, you would probably figure out that maybe what you should do is to begin either learning some Thai or pulling someone in who could help you minister to those people who spoke differently. So, so what if this started to happen? Right? If that language started to change, you would have to figure out, now how am I gonna reach this group? And the problem with this is, is that this language is created by people who are younger. So instead of, instead of our, our authority being people who are older, who know more, whom God has given wisdom, now our authority are the people creating the language who are like 10. So this creates a, a bit of conflict in our ministries. We both need to come, come in and engage them because they really do speak a different language. It's as if they're from a different culture. And yet to still figure out, how do we look at what Paul says about how older men and older women are supposed to disciple younger men and younger women? How do we do that in a world where younger people are driving language? What do we do there? This is gonna be something that you're gonna to have to ask and answer in your own ministries. Um, at the same time, as much as it's important, I think, to be looking at technology and trying to understand how it's working, there's also some powerful myths that are built into technology that sometimes we don't even realize. It's not so much about the devices themselves, iPhones, iPads, projectors. It's about the kind of thinking that they engender and they inculcate in us. And I'll give you an example of this. One of the best myths that you see all the time in between every show that you watch is this myth, that if you have a problem, you can add a product and you'll get happiness. This is the way every commercial works, right? It starts out with kind of the stereotypical wife and she's going, oh, this is so hard, I can't clean, it's so dirty. And then a new product comes out and she's smiling and her eyes glimmer and all that stuff because she got the new Dyson or whatever, the $300 vacuum. Or the, or the guy who's so sad and depressed but he gets a new Porsche and then he's happy. This is the, the little trope that every 30 second advertisement gives us. So when we see a product, we go, oh, I know what the problem was and I know what's gonna happen with that, right? But we get so used to that, that sometimes when a product comes along, we really don't know what problem it was solving. But somehow we believe that, oh, it, it's gonna make things better for me, so I should buy them. Here's my $500. So we immediately start to get it. And, and those of us who all have iPads, we go, they're great, but I don't really know why I still use it. Or I don't know, I didn't know that I needed it until they showed me. And so I believe that it will make me more efficient or, or better somehow. So. That's part of the problem is that we begin to believe that we need things, but the other part is that this thinking is so ingrained in us that we begin to apply it to things like this, right? This is the way that we start to think of the gospel as this problem that Jesus the easy button fixes. That he just suddenly comes along and everything's better. I remember thinking about how, how would I get us to do our, uh, tell our testimonies, right? I was bad, Jesus came along, I was good. And if you can find someone with a really bad story, that's the best kind, right? Because it fits this commercial structure much, much better. When I was a youth pastor and I would deal with a, a seventh grader and ask them, could you give your testimony? Could you talk about how bad you were and then Jesus came and how good you were? And he was like, well, I used to th suck my thumb and then I met Jesus and now I don't? And he didn't know how to fit this model because it didn't work for him. And in part because the true reality is that sometimes it's backwards, isn't it? It's happiness plus the cross leads to adversity. It's the opposite. And we're selling people something that sounds like a commercial, but that's not really how it works, is it? Jesus comes along and he does give us freedom from sin he adopts us into a family, but he doesn't guarantee happiness. Sometimes it's this kind of adversity that leads to character, but sometimes it just leads to more mystery. And we need to be careful that the gospel that we're giving is not packaged up so much like a commercial that it no longer is the gospel anymore. 
So in all areas, we need to continually be thinking, how is the thinking patterns of technology shaping the kinds of ministry that I'm doing? Am I looking at people in the spiritual life like an assembly line? Do I just wanna put them through a program and have them come out in a certain way? Or do I look at them as someone that's a unique person in the image of God that he is transforming in some way that I may not fully understand and I wanna come alongside them and walk with them? Or do I just wanna stamp them through and say they did all these programs and they're ready to go? So we wanna be thinking more deeply about how to see people as people and not as products. And the gospel is something that's more complex than just a button that you press. A third thing is that we're gonna have to decide how do we figure out the best mediums for for us to communicate with people. So we have all these things available to us. For example, if this is my very first slide, I want you to read it and decide if you believe the message of the slide. Let's see what you guys see. Yeah, it's kinda hard to read, isn't it? It says I'm awesome at PowerPoint. Is that true? Am I awesome at PowerPoint because of this slide? Not really. In this case, there's a message here, I'm awesome at PowerPoint. And there's also a a medium that's surrounding that, that's carrying that message from me to you. But those two are in conflict, aren't they? The medium doesn't match the message and they they don't really work together. Now, we see this all the time when, when speakers say something like, humble yourself before the Lord. They don't appear to be terribly humble individuals themselves, right? The medium and the message are in conflict in this case. And, and this is how we, we teach our kids. We say that 90% of communication is nonverbal. It's all of those other things. So that when two people begin to talk and they say something like, I love you, there's all these other things that affect the way that someone hears them, even how much coffee you've had that day. All of those things begin to, to change and shape the message. It's all this meta communication that goes on anytime we communicate with somebody. So I can say I love you in a funny way, in an ironic way, in a meaningful way, in a sarcastic way. All of those things change the actual, actual message that someone hears. Now if you take that a spoken word of I love you and you transfer it to a device, this changes, doesn't it? You lose some of these factors about human to human, human communication. You, you still get tone of voice and maybe some other things, but you no longer get the clothing or how attractive that person is. You don't know what their race is. You still have a little bit of the relationship and, and coffee is still there, but, but body language is gone. So all you're left with is tone of voice. It's still a, a helpful way of communicating to somebody, but it's gone. And so uh, we find that in the early 1900s when people were trying to figure out how to use phones, there was this whole debate about how informal you could be because the word to call on used to mean that you would go to someone's house and leave a note that you were gonna come back later and it would be a very formal exchange for which you would dress up and you would have, have things that you were ready to talk about. But on the phone, you could just be in your underwear talking about whatever. And so it became a lot less formal and many, many people were worried about that. I found a a book that's about 200 pages on whether or not you could say hello when you first called somebody. So things begin to change when we change the same exact message, but we've changed mediums. Now imagine we'd move from the phone. Um, I I wanna mention that the phone also has some of its own priorities, like speed and efficiency that we gain out of this. So the phone isn't entirely bad. It really has some some really helpful things that it gives us in emergency situations um, when we really need to get something there. But if we change mediums to something else, so to texting or or iPads or computers, and we say those same words, we now have lost that, that tone of voice, right? That's no longer there. And now there's less and less of the human part of communication and more and more the priorities of the device. So your tone of voice, your body language, the way you look, all of those things are replaced by the priorities of the device. And again, in many cases, this is really helpful. So if there was a, you know, a, a terrible situation like a, like a shooter on campus, we would want the speed and efficiency and anonymity of a text message to get us out of here. That's exactly what we would want. The problem comes when someone does something a little bit more negative. And then now those priorities of the device start to come across as coldness and harshness. So when we think about communicating messages and the packages that we put around them and the way we transfer them, we wanna be thinking about which medium is actually best for us to use. And the trick is that if we were to look down this this list of mediums and, and which one we should use and play the game of choose that medium, a lot of younger kids don't even have that concept in their mind. I've, I've read articles about adults uh, who are criticizing young kids for spending time on Facebook, and they'll say something like this. Back in my day, we used to spend time in person and talk on the phone, and kids these days, they text. Did you catch the error there? 
For that person, being in person and talking on the phone was the exact same thing to them. But they saw the kids, the kids medium of Facebook as, as this horrible thing without realizing how they viewed the phone in their own, in their own life. And so whatever you're born with, you tend to, tend to have a little bit less discernment about. So we need to help people think through these things. So we'll play a little game here in, here in the audience and you guys can test the professors and see if they get it right, okay? So if you were just gonna share an address or a phone number, which is the best one for you to use on here? Text maybe, okay, text, okay, yeah, good job. Okay. Um, how about if you wanted to transfer specs on a group assignment? Which one maybe would you use? What's that? Yeah, email, maybe something like that. Maybe you could get away with a text, but you might, might change mediums there. How about if you were going to brainstorm on a new ministry? What might be the, your best tool in that case? Probably in person. Even, even business manuals today do this same thing. So they have a hierarchy of which ones of these things they should use for things like brainstorming or transferring information. And they're doing this because it makes them more money. So they know that if they choose the correct medium, their bottom line is better. Now, we care about things more important than a bottom line, don't we? And so I think we need to have the same exact discernment that just a business would have. How about conflict resolution? Email, text, you guys are right. Good job. Okay. Um, now, have you guys ever had a problem with that? I mean, people have accidentally misunderstood your intentions? That is so weird. It's never happened to me. Um, how about encouragement? This is a trick question. Yeah. All different kinds of things can mean things. Now, one of the interesting things you'll find out is that when people want to do something meaningful, they just naturally use older things sometimes. So when we get married, we wear tuxedos for some reason, right? Don't we? When we go down to Fort Worth, how do you make the date more special? You ride behind a horse, don't you? You get in a carriage. All of a sudden, your date just went, got a lot better, didn't it, guys, if you get that carriage? Sometimes when you do older things, for some reason, it's built into us that it's more meaningful. And sometimes a paper note can sometimes feel more meaningful to people. Now, that might not be true in all situations and with each person. So this kind of starts to become like, like Gary Smalley's book, The Five Love Languages. Now there's like the 67 mediums that you need to think through and think through what is the thing that will most communicate to this person and how do I like to be communicated to and be open and talk about those things because there's a lot of misunderstanding that can happen when we don't. Um, how about an apology to a congregation? Okay, so you think in person, right? But what about all those people that don't get to hear it? What would you do? How would you want to make sure that they all get it? Now, I, I know a church in the area that recently had something like this, and they thought, well, let's make sure that everybody can, can see this. So they put it on Facebook. Now, the problem with that wasn't that they were communicating to the people, but that Facebook allowed the congregants to come in and comment. And some of them liked the apology, and some of them didn't, and it went back and forth, and they had to take it off because it didn't go real well. So if they had emailed it, then there wouldn't have been that chance for people to snipe at each other. So they didn't really think through which medium is best for this kind of communication. And this is something we're gonna have to be doing time and time again to think through and play the game of choose that medium. Now, when you are particularly hot and you're a little bit angry, you need to come up with a mechanism to help you cool down. And I'm gonna take a verse way out of context. So professors, please close your eyes for a second. Okay. So, do you remember when Jesus cleared the temple? <laughs> okay, there's this little note in John that he spent time making his own whip, okay? Now, if he was really, really angry and he just went right in there, of course he's the sinless son of God and he's incapable of sinning. But isn't it interesting that he spent time making that whip for a minute? He was able to cool down and collect his thoughts and come in there and, and just hit those money changers just perfectly, you know? He practiced his aim. I think we need the same kind of thing in our own life. We need built-in ways to slow down when we're hot. Because if you get right on Twitter, you get right on Facebook, chances are you're gonna say something that you'll regret later. Thank you guys for not, not uh, throwing me out, out of the room for that. I appreciate that. Um, so I'm having a little technology fail. I'm trying to get this to skip to the next slide. So let me see if I can get it. There we go, okay. Now how about this one? Education, what is the best way for us to transfer theological knowledge and spiritual formation? We're, we're all dealing with this as seminaries. How do we deal with this thing? And in and, and many schools, we're finding out that once lectures are recorded, they find it helpful to have the students go watch the lectures at home and use classroom time to actually discuss things. It's called the flipped classroom. And already built into our education, for every one hour that you're in the classroom, you're supposed to spend like two or three hours studying, right? 
So by default, our entire educational process is at least 66% disembodied. Isn't that weird? If we really think about the way that we do education, you're supposed to be by yourself in a room with a book communicating with a dead guy for at least two thirds of your degree. So the way that we think about education and technology and the ways that we think about things aren't always as obvious as they seem. And we're constantly thinking through this. How do we do this process of taking you guys who are out here and helping equip you for a lifetime of ministry? And it's a, it's a tricky process that, you, that we're thinking through here and you'll need to be thinking through in your ministry as well. Another one is this managing your own personal technological transformation. So when you think about a tool like a shovel, generally speaking, we think of this as just neutral. There's really nothing bad or good about it. You can use it for good things like building a church or bad things like ax murdering people. But in general, the tool itself we think of as, as being really pretty neutral. Just use it for good or use it for bad. But in reality, when we come into the world and we make a hole with that shovel, something happens to us, doesn't it? What happens to your hands? Yeah, they get blisters and over time they get calluses. You like how the slide turned red? It's my little illustration. Um, and, and maybe even your muscles would get bigger over time. You are transformed whether you're building churches or ax murdering. It doesn't matter the morality of your actions. You're still transformed by the tool. Okay? Now, when we go into the gym, we do this all the time. We choose tools based on how we want to shape ourselves. So if we want long, lean legs, we choose one tool. And if we want big, strong legs, we choose another tool. And repetition, repetition, repetition over time changes us. But it only changes us in one direction at a time. So if you want to be a championship bodybuilder, you can't be a marathon runner at the same time. And if you want to be a marathon runner, you're never going to have gigantic muscles, are you? You're only going to go one direction or the other. You can't have both. And it's the same way with mental technologies. So I, I wrote a little program to take some of the best books in all of Western culture that my wife told me were good, found all of the number of words in each book and counted them up. So this is the number of words in all of these famous books that we should all be reading, including the Old and New Testament. Now let's compare that with Facebook. If, if we just check it three times a day, no big deal, just breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And... Uh, we just read 30 friends, and they only have 60 words every day. How many words do you think that is? Oh, man. Isn't that weird? Somehow we feel like we can't read all of those books on the left, but we can do the activity on the right. The reality is that people today are actually reading and writing more than at any time in human history. The difficulty is that they're doing a different kind of reading and a different kind of writing. So this is, this is maybe the equivalent of those, those two exercise machines we talked about before. They're two different kinds of skills that are hard to have at the same time. It's difficult to gain the ability to read lots of short status updates and at the same time be able to read for an hour and a half straight. And it's hard to read for an hour and a half straight and then go look at Facebook. They're a little bit mutually exclusive to some extent. And you're going to have to ask yourself, what kind of person, what kind of mind do I want to be shaping? When you walk into McDonald's, you know how you're going to shape your stomach, right? When you walk into the gym, you know how you're going to shape your arms. When you pull out a device, you need to be thinking about how you're going to shape your mind. Because when we look at, at studies about how often people read the Bible, um, it's a study by Lifeway. They would say only 20% of people, or even less than that, read their Bible every day. Now, I know you are seminarians, and so you are forced to read your Bible more often, but many people are only reading it 20% of the time. The interesting thing about this statistic is it's a statistic that the Bible never tells you to do. Can anybody find a verse that tells me you should read your Bible every day? What, what are the commands it tells you? If you went into your Logos Bible software and you found scripture and word in, the, uh, in an objective sense or in an accusative case, what would it say? What are the verbs applied to it? There are things like hear and keep. There are things like meditate. What does meditate require that you do? Now, if I, open, if I take out this thing, I have access to probably 100 different Bible versions and probably thousands and thousands of resources. And you do too. I would ask you this, how many verses do you have access to in your mind? How much wisdom from the scriptures is stored in your soul to change you, to transform you, to transform others? Or do you just have access to it like everybody else? This is a very, very important part of who you're becoming here at the seminary. Are you learning how to get to information or are you learning how to, how to make that be part of who you are? Are you gonna come up to somebody who's saying, I'm, I'm really struggling, I just need some hope. Is there anything in the scriptures? And you say, hang on just a sec, let me find some. Is that gonna be the kind of minister that you are or are you gonna be internalizing this, these things? 
This is what I would encourage of you is that you choose to put these things in your mind and let them transform you. Again, I think we're also gonna have to be addressing technology in our church buildings and in our congregations, the way that we do church. Because there are more and more iPads coming into our churches, aren't there? There, there are so many things I would like to say about that picture, but I'm gonna let them go. Um, <laughs> If you, if you look around and you notice someone using their iPad and they're, and they're using it to access the scriptures, it's a really interesting experience to watch somebody, isn't it? Now, now, sometimes they play games and sometimes they text and they do those things, but even when they're reading the Bible, it seems a little bit inherently distracting to some extent, right? Because a screen doesn't look the same way as a, as a, as a text page does. It, it has some brightness to it. It casts light up on their face, and so you always see it out of the corner of their eye. We all know what this motion is, don't we? This is something that we've learned from when we were little kids. But when you see someone doing this, you know, and, and, and doing this, it feels funny to you in, in there. And you're going to have to address that. That old statement of please silence your cell phones is now please use your devices responsibly. And something that we need to be addressing in our churches. And at the same time, for us, we need to be thinking about what kinds of technologies we're going to allow in our churches. So I remember one time reading that Chuck Swindoll said, when you put a, a, a camera in a church, it changes the way a man views himself. When he's magnified up on a screen, it's possible that he will see himself as bigger than he really is. And so everything that we do from how we have a blog or, you know, I've got like 3,000 followers on Twitter, it's no big deal. How, how we think of ourselves and what kinds of persons we think we are and how much ministry we think we have and is our sermons, is the, the quality of them, is that what we value or is it that stuff that people don't see? Which one of those is valuable? We need to be thinking about how technology shapes the way that we view ourselves. And all of us are doing this all the time with our identity. We, we oftentimes look at Facebook or something like that and we think, how should I be using this in my own ministry? Possibly a better question might mean, what does this mean for us? How, do I, how am I viewing myself as I craft my own identity on Facebook? And when I go on and I look at Facebook, how do I view other people? Because sometimes I go on there after changing kids' diapers all day, and I feel a little bit sad about myself because everybody else is having a better time than me. So we need to constantly be thinking about our own identity and our own relationships. And we also need to be thinking about the spirituality of technology. One way of thinking about technology is that it's an extension of us. So we think of microphones as extending our voice and telescopes extending our eyes and cars extending our legs. So when we take our natural ability to talk to people and we magnify that with a microphone, it, it, it really is something that's going deep down into our hearts and affecting who we are. So that when we do something negative and we say something negative, the microphone is amplifying the brokenness of our hearts. So that this heart is really the root problem. The technology isn't really causing us to do anything. It's something that draws out things. So when I have a struggle like gambling and I'm at Kroger, no big deal. When I'm at a casino, it's a big deal. The place where I am draws out characteristics. And if I think about alcohol and where I am or sensuality and where I am or self-focus and where I am, all of these things may draw out certain sins in you. They don't cause you to do it, but they pull that out of you. And if we think about moving from... Um, from older technologies to things like phones, these are extending more and more and more of ourselves. And they're coming closer and closer and closer to our hearts. They have more and more and more access to who we are. So we need to be very, very careful with thinking theologically and spiritually about how our hearts are operating, that we think this is really a battle between the flesh and the spirit, back and forth, back and forth. I'm gonna just skip this video for a minute. Um, this is a video from a ministry called Need Him that does a lot of work with, with uh, people who are, who are wanting to text about Jesus. And so they have a really, really wonderful ministry where they're saying, you know, this phone is so, so close to people's hearts that they find this is a great way to do evangelism. So if you were to go to needhim.org, you could sign up to be one of these counselors for people. Another one that I think we just have to talk about, even though we're running a little short on time, is the issue of pornography. What, what is happening here is we're finding that, you know, you wanna be protecting your kids from pornography. You wanna be putting safeguards there so that they don't grow up in a world where they're seeing things that they shouldn't see before they should see them or ever at all. But like it or not, even if you prevent your kids from being in, in that 10% range, they're gonna be around other kids and all of them are gonna be people who have seen pornography. This is an absolutely must talk about issue. You need to talk to your kids earlier and earlier, unfortunately, about sex and your, how early is early enough is really who do you want to be talking to them first, you or the friend at school? Because all of them are seeing these things. Um, all the searches on the internet are for pornography. Almost all men and young adults, they're all looking at pornography all the time. 
And if, if that sounds bad enough, back in 2004, more than half of all pastors were regularly struggling with pornography. I'm sure that number's higher, and I'm sure that it's at least something here at the seminary, isn't it? And I don't say this to, to shame us because this is something that women are struggling with as well. I say this because sometimes we think that, oh, I, I can deal with this. Next time, I'll just say, I'm just not gonna do this anymore and it's gonna, it's gonna just go away like that. But the reality is the more that we do this stuff, the more that we look at this, it starts to create kind of neural pathways in our mind and that, that it becomes a habit-forming thing that's very, very, very difficult to break. It's not something that you can just will yourself and decide not to. It, form, it functions just like an addiction. We're all comfortable with talking about alcohol and drug addiction, but we need to become more and more familiar with talking about pornography as a deep and dark addiction that it's very hard to get out of. So you can use some of these, we talked about the power of images yesterday that I'll skip. We could talk about these tools like Covenant Eyes and Savvy that help you be, be accountable with your friends. We can even talk about the neat things that churches like Life Church are doing to create YouTube ads for kind of bad words, you know, the kind of bad words that people would be searching for. They create ads for those terms on Sunday and say, maybe you'd like to try something different and they direct them to their church. So they're actually trying to reach out to these people that are really struggling. But at the same time, sometimes you might just need direct counseling. This software stuff is great, but those of us who are smart, we can easily break it, can't we? We can just get right past it and we can lie. Sometimes if you're deep into this stuff, you need to get some counseling and you need to get it before you leave seminary because it won't go away. And it won't go away when you get married and it won't go away if your wife gets prettier. It's a problem with you and it's deep and it's dark and you need help. And you need to be ready to help other people because when we look out in our world, we're concerned with all kinds of sexual issues and marriage issues out there. But even if you know, 10% of our church is struggling with same-sex attraction, the other 90% is struggling with pornography. This is something we're gonna have to continually address. So the last thing I just wanna mention is I think it's worth us thinking about our boundaries in a, in a prior age. We used to have family and work and leisure all in the same place and these fears were all split at some point when we moved into cities. But now with the devices, it's constantly mixed and we see scenes like this all the time on playgrounds everywhere. The kids who are now graduating from high school are the first generation of kids that had to compete with their parents for cell phones. When they picked them up in the carpool lanes, they weren't looking for their parents anymore because their parents were on their phones. And so we're gonna need to figure out ways to, to help kids differentiate because whether dad's working, dad's on the Bible, dad's playing solitaire, they all look the same. And so this is why you might wanna bring out your print Bible every now and again and not just always use your computer so that your kids see you engaging with God's word. And finally, there's some great ways to do some boundaries to create a technology basket at home where everybody puts their devices in and you have an hour or two off where no one's using the device. Dad's not using it, mom's not using it, kids aren't using it, but it's family time. When you go out to lunch with friends, you can stack up your phones on the table and the first person to answer it has to pay for lunch. So that's another, another way of, of valuing friendships. And, and sometimes, you know, I found in my own life that I would carry my phone around as a clock, but when I'd be with my kids, I would also check my email because Mark Yarbrough emails me all the time. And so I would have to check my email. So I didn't want him to do that, so I put the phone away and I got a watch so that I could still spend time with my kids and not be tempted in that way. So again, I think what we wanna be remembering is that this is something that's given to us by God. It's a great gift. It's part of the whole biblical story, but it's very transformative in our lives and we need to more and more address it. We address money all the time because it's this non-neutral thing that we need to be thinking about and it shapes us and in America, it's a big part of who we are. We're consumers with money. I think technology is the same thing. It's something that God has given us, but it's also very, very, very powerful and I would pray that we would use it well. So let me pray. Thanks for staying with me a few extra minutes. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for being a good God and for being uh, so omnipotent and omnipresent that none of this stuff surprises you. When something new comes along, we get worried, but we, we thank you that you know what's going on and we just pray that we would have your spirit inside of us giving us wisdom and that we would um, believe the gospel of your son in a way that is, that is not uh, deformed or distorted by our age, by our consumerism, by our technology, but instead that we would, believe, we, we would believe the words of what Jesus actually said. We would believe that we are forgiven of all the sins, whether they are pornography or technology, that those things are gone and they're forgiven and that we've been washed, that we're adopted into your, to your family. God, we also pray that you would help us know how then do we become more like your son? How do we be sanctified? And how do we sometimes use technology and sometimes put it away for a while? God, just pray that you would give these students here discernment and give all of us here at the seminary discernment as we go forward. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen.